Greetings guys, I hope you're well. I wanna spend a couple of minutes today talking to you about muzzles, muzzles, and some of the consequences associated with their use. Now, first of all, what is a muzzle? A muzzle is a device that we will often put on our dogs to prevent them from biting during certain situations. And they come in various sizes, as you can imagine, and different types of material, everything from wire to nylon to leather like this one, and they usually have some ability for the dog to breathe through the muzzle, otherwise you run the risk that they can overheat. Now, why would our dogs use their fangs in the first place? Well, it's really for three unique reasons. One, I either want to acquire something of value and I need to get that thing using force. Uh, another one would be defending something of value. I want to defend it. And again, I will use force to achieve my objective. And then lastly, I need to defend myself, the most valuable resource there is from you. I feel threatened by you and you've really left me with no other choice but to use my fangs. And that's what I mean. Listen to that, no other choice but to use my fangs. When nature gave animals the ability to escape a threat, the first thing they want them to use is their legs. Just move away. Distance is safety. However, if you can't put distance between you and your threat, well, I have no choice but to now use my fangs. And in many situations in which we use muzzles, that's exactly the case that occurs. The dog is caught in a situation in which it can't run away and is forced to deal with the threat. And therefore, it falls back on aggression. And we use the muzzles to protect all those people that the dog would be using those fangs against. Now, the situations in which we see this the most often are with the veterinarian, when we take our dogs to the veterinarian. It's not a whole lot of dogs unless you happen to be a veterinarian or you work at a vet hospital and you take your dog to work every day with you. Not a lot of dogs dig going to the vet. There are so many that just do not. They are very fearful of the veterinarian. And then we have the groomer. Yeah, not every dog out there likes to have their nails trimmed. And they all start to act pretty aggressively when you try to trim my nails or you handle me around a sensitive area like maybe my cheeks or my ears or around my, my muzzle itself. I'll try to bite you. And then there's social interactions. Not every dog is social and feels comfortable with every human, especially small humans like children or other dogs. And oftentimes people will put a muzzle on their dog to prevent them from biting those small children and biting those other dogs. And I get that, I honestly do. I owned a vet hospital for many years and I was really appreciative of the fact that people brought some dogs in wearing a muzzle. I do canine pharmacotherapy. I deal with dogs that suffer from psychiatric disorders very similar to those of humans. And sometimes when the owner of the dog, the afflicted dog comes to me, I'm the target. Yeah, I'm the intended target of the dog. They wanna bite Daryl Bryan. They don't even know Daryl Bryan, but they wanna bite me nevertheless. And I'm really appreciative of the fact that they're wearing a muzzle when they first come in. But know this, in short order, once I achieve that they're able to hang off to their dogs and we have safety redundancies, the first thing I tell them to do is remove the muzzle. And here's why. And because nature gave your dog the means to survive whenever it encounters a dangerous threat. And the number one means is run, just run. Put distance between you and that threat. However, if I can't run because I happen to be in a small room like a veterinary exam room, I just call those things, most of them, an oversized crate. They're really small with an exam table. There's only one way in, only one way out. So it looks like a big crate. Now you have a cornered animal being handled, being poked and prodded by unfamiliar people. Groomer, same thing. I'm on a grooming table. Ugh, I may be in a, in a grooming a noose. I could also be in a grooming tub with my head stuck to an eye bolt in there so I can't bite anyone. It's a small confined area. And then in social interactions, well, maybe the area is larger, but the darn threat keeps chasing me down. I can't seem to get away from it. I only have a, a finite amount of space or distance I can put between me and the threat, but the darn thing keeps coming over here where I'm at. I try to go to the corner and next thing you know, the thing's still in my grill. So in these situations here, when this occurs and I suddenly can't run away, well, 
if I feel threatened enough, I'm going to bite you. Absolutely. If I can't get away from you, I'll make you get away from me. Now, here's the whole purpose of this video. Because I understand that we use muzzles to create safety, to mitigate risk associated with animals who may choose to use their fangs. But guys, there's a consequence involved with most dogs. And here's how it happens. Okay, so follow me here. Muzzle, meaning we use it to go to the veterinarian. We use the muzzle to go to the groomer. And we use the muzzle for those social interactions. Okay, recently I've had a couple of clients whose dogs definitely became anxious when they put the muzzle on them. Yeah, anytime you eliminate options for people or dogs, especially options that I have, weapons that I may possess to deal with a threat, you can bet my stress response is going to go through the roof. And a muzzle disarms your dog. I can't use my fangs. This would be like me dropping you off in a very dangerous place with your hands handcuffed, either in front of you or behind you, or your feet shackled. Yeah, things just got a whole lot more dire. That acute physical crisis is just around the corner about to happen, and I have no way to defend myself from that. So the immediate use of a muzzle for your dog will immediately send it up the arousal call. The stress response will be mobilized. And again, high heart rate, oxygen, eyes dilated, senses on alert. I am ready to do whatever I need to do to escape this thing. And this is what happens because it goes up when I visit the vet, the groomer, or the social interaction. But now what's happened is this. I've had several clients recently, they've been using the muzzle and they told me for a year, two years, three years to go to all of these situations. But now what they've noticed is that their dog is anxious anytime it's on a leash. In other words, it used to enjoy being taken for a walk, but now it's anxious. And it's definitely anxious anytime it's in a car. And now, it's any time I'm in a car near a certain location. So what's happening here is this. Okay, if you're going to take your dog to a vet, to a groomer, or usually to have some sort of social interaction, and many times we will insert a leash. Okay, instead of writing that three times, I put a little deal marks there. So suddenly you now have a leash between the muzzle and the vet. So now the dog's either on a leash already and then you put on the muzzle or you put on the muzzle, put your dog on a leash because the leash is now used to go to the vet, to the groomer, to the social interaction. And then along the way, let's go ahead and just X this out and let's add a car because now we put the dog on a muzzle, on a leash, in the car, take it to the vet, take it to the groomer, and so on and so forth. And this veterinarian and this groomer and this place where you're taking the dog happens to be in a certain particular location. And because animals learn through what's called latent learning, latent knowledge, meaning they do start to learn things over a period of time where they are and what it means to them depending upon where they are. Uh, I've done videos and I've told you in the past that if you take Captain, my dog, my cattle dog, for a ride in a car, you honestly won't even know he's in there. He'll just lay down, he won't make a peep one. But about a mile or two from work here, up pops his head and he's looking out the window, you can see him here, there he starts to pace back and forth in the back of the SUV, whining. Same thing as we get home. Even our mountain home, which we frequent maybe half a dozen times a year, maybe a little more, and he'll go several months in between here and there. His head pops up the second we get close. And so that's now how we have geographic areas filling in here. And all of those add up what's called a signal suite, a suite of signals that equals an event, a provocative event, or they lead to a provocative stimulus. Case in point, I'm riding a motorcycle or driving a car down a dirt road and I see a red light up in a tree. Well, I might be curious as to why there's a red light up in that tree, 
but I wouldn't stop my car or the motorcycle because it's missing all the rest of the stuff. All the stuff that goes with the red light, the rectangular box, the other two lights that accompany it, it being suspended over an intersection. Those are known as signal suites. Well, what you're creating here is the same thing. The leash, the car, the locale, and that muzzle, all of those equal veterinarian, equals groomer, equals social interaction that I find fearful. And when that happens, it becomes a lot like a compound signal. And I tell people when things become compounded, meaning you have multiple signals occurring that are all designed, all given to create a specific response, then those signals become either ors. Case in point, you have a wolf, you don't want them to have, when they're interacting, maybe with a subordinate wolf, to have to give their entire repertoire of signals. In other words, can I just start off with just a look, maybe out the corner of my eye. And then if that doesn't work, let me add standing taunt to it and flex my muscles a little bit. And if that doesn't work, let me raise my lips and show my teeth. Maybe my hair comes up in the back, making me larger than what I really am. And along comes my tail. Wow, all of those are still there to create one response from you. Go away from me. Distance, back off. If you were coming over here, think twice, baby. You need to hit the road and go that way. And they start off with one, then the next one, then the next one, and it's a big complex suite. But the next time that same animal approaches, huh, now maybe I can get away with just a stare this time. What's happening here is the same thing. A signal suite has developed. And that means that now you may not put a muzzle on your dog, but you may grab just the leash. And when I grab just the leash, then an animal who's extremely fearful of these outcomes, these places, these people can immediately associate, oh no, there's the leash, which means we're going here. It can happen that way. Sometimes it just starts to happen in reverse order, meaning it's a dog who gets very apprehensive with the muzzle. And then it's the muzzle and the leash. But the car ride's fine. Or the leash was fine. It was just the muzzle. But then all of a sudden, now it's the muzzle and the leash. And then it's the muzzle and the leash and the car. And then it's the muzzle and the leash and the car in a certain location that happens to be near where these dangerous things are. And then, of course, it's within here, the individuals within it. And then over time, well, give me one, give me two, give me three, give me any combination thereof, and I have a very, very anxious animal. So what do you do instead? Again, I, as you heard me say already, there's, there's a need for muzzles. There are definite needs for them. But here's a couple things I want you to think about. A lot of people, they try to desensitize their dog to the use of the muzzle. But I will tell you this much. Anytime you try a desensitization approach, you're really hoping for habituation. You hope that they just habituate to this. They don't really care later on. But the issue with that is that to habituate to something, you have to be really undergoing constant exposure to either that event or that particular stimulus or stimuli. It is constant exposure. So I buy a clock to put in my home office and it goes tick, 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 tick. I'm thinking first day, why in the heck did I get that clock? That thing is driving me crazy. But under constant exposure, many hours spent in my office, well, I don't hear the ticking any longer. But if the clock went tick, 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 tick for a day, and then I removed it. And then a year later, someone stuck it back in my room. I'm now sensitized to the clock. And that is the problem. How often does your dog go to the groomer? How often does your dog go to the vet? How many times do you place your dog in a social environment 
in which he feels threatened. At least I hope you don't. I hope you don't force your dog to go to a dog park that really is terrified of a dog park or terrified of a daycare. I hope you allow the dog to avoid that particular setting. But you have to think about that. You're really never going to reach a state of habituation unless you have constant exposure to the provocative event or the provocative stimulus. So that being said, what do I do? What have I done with my dogs in the past? Because trust, trust me, Captain's a little bit fearful of going to the veterinarian. He, that's not his favorite day. I'm just going to tell it to you right now. Uh, and there's some social interactions that he doesn't like. I just kind of avoid those. And fortunately, he's a cattle dog. He really doesn't have to go to the groomer. But we do own two dogs that are Mortys, little Maltese Yorkie mixes, that have to go to a groomer occasionally, about once every uh, two, three months, depending upon what time of the year and how much hair we need to have to cut off. Probably the same thing with you guys. So here's what I recommend. The muzzle, again, has its place. And if we're going to use the muzzle, because if you don't use the muzzle, it's initial success or it's total failure. Your dog just bites someone. And you're going to feel horrible about that, and they're going to feel horrible about you allowing their dog to bite them. Uh, so what I recommend is add chemicals. Either depend upon chemicals or use chemicals to help keep your dog driven down in the stress response. Case in point, with our two Morkies, Dave and Poe, I just give them CBD, cannabidiol, one of the extracts from hemp. Not tetrahydrocannabinol, the thing that they may see a purple elephant if I give that to them. No, cannabidiol, the one that kind of mellows you out, kind of stimulates the parasympathetic nervous system, makes you mellow, makes you want to go to Taco Bell at 2 a.m., whether you're going to the groomer or not. That's the thing that works perfectly for them. It drives them far enough down that it was very noticeable by their groomer. Their, the very first time I used it, the groomer noticed it and said, hey, we had a really great grooming experience today. Poe wasn't shaking. They actually seemed to enjoy the experience a whole lot more. Uh, for other dogs that I've owned and other dogs that used to come to our veterinary hospital, we would use what's called a chill protocol. And that'd be a combination of gabapentin, a pain medication, but a medication is also uh, that I use in canine pharmacotherapy for social fear, for social pain, not just physical pain. If you dole the physical pain, you end up doling the social pain because they both come from the same region of the brain, the dorsal region of the anterior cingulate cortex. So gabapentin along with trazodone to help sedate the dog a little bit. And what you're trying to do there is that this is not behavior modification in the sense that I want you to learn to love the veterinary. I want you to learn to love the groomer. I want you to learn to love children. Oh no, this is a situation where you're only going here about three times a year to the groomer, you're going to the veterinary one time a year, and we only have those kids over during the holidays. Which means pick battles big enough to matter, small enough to win. I don't even start to approach anything like that from a desensitization program. No way. You're not going to get it done. I don't have constant exposure to this provocative event or this provocative stimulus. Instead, I manage the situation. And by managing, if I can give the dog certain chemicals to relax them, to drive them down in their arousal column, to arrest them at a certain level in their arousal column, then I stand the chance that I won't incur all these other consequences. Because it really does. It just depends upon the dog, their genetic baseline from a personality standpoint, how they can weather the effects of stress, how terrified they become. You can start getting into PTSD situations all triggered by that thing. Then suddenly triggered by the leash by itself and the car by itself and a certain location by itself. You won't need all of these to create a sudden uproar in your stress response. You won't need it. And then that starts to create what we call pathological stress. And that's a death spiral right down that rabbit hole. So think about that. Talk to your veterinarian. And, you know, for those of you who have dogs who aren't terrified of these situations, but, you know, I don't really like it, but kind of like post, you should just shake a little bit. Ah, try like a nutraceutical, something like uh, cannabidiol, CBD. You can also try, there's a lot of calming caplets out there now, calming diets that you can give to your dog. And if those don't work, you don't get enough response from it, then talk to your veterinarian. There's so many things that can be used. Gabapentin can be used, trazodone, clonidine. There are so many medications that can be given. They have a half-life. They're only good for about seven hours, typically long enough to take your dog to the groomer, have your dog groomed, and bring your dog back and start to come off of that little mellow that they induced state. And they're better for it. 
And again, I, I've done this for years and years to help people with their dogs. Uh, I used to fly dogs from overseas to overseas. And you know what? That was, that was only going to happen once in their lives. So there's no need in kind of learning what it's like to ride in a cargo hold of a plane. Tell you what, I'm just going to send you to your happy place. And when you arrive, you'll arrive happy. And you'll wonder, where the heck am I? Huh? How'd I get here? Huh, don't worry about it. It's a cool place, though. You'll love it. Really think about that. Really think about chemicals. You know, I, I always seem to try and I fight this all the time because I don't know what it is with people. They don't have a problem taking an Advil when they have a little pain in their elbow. But a lot of people certainly have a big problem giving their dogs any type of medications to give them some relief. Guys, it's been done for, gosh, decades and decades. Perfectly safe. Consult with your veterinarian about it. Get something to chemically manage your dog in these states here so we don't start having a super, super signal suite where all of a sudden, one day, you put your dog on a leash and a child goes running by and your dog bites the child. Or you just have your dog on a leash that would never bite a child and suddenly does, or never bite a person but suddenly does. Because I didn't need the context of the interior of the veterinary hospital. I just needed a leash because the leash is what transports me to here. And when it comes to sensitizing an animal or person, just one time can do it. It doesn't take constant exposure to sensitize someone to any sort of provocative stimulus. Just want to give that to you today, guys. Put this out here real quick. Think about it. Think about it. And if you have any questions, you know where to reach me. Send it to Brian with a Y at TamingTheWild.com. And if you want any more information on really anything that has to do with dogs' behavior, training, pharmacotherapy, hey, just click on the link. We're going to drop a couple links underneath this video. Click on them. There's information for you. And of course, just reach out to a human being when you really have complex questions and we'll do our best to answer those for you and get you started on the right program. All right, guys. So again, use them if you have them. But think about what can happen, though. There's a lot more than just you protecting your veterinarian. There are a lot of consequences outside of that. And I just want to make you aware of that so think chemicals, that's the new management tool. That's the new muzzle, our chemicals. Take care. If you enjoy my videos, make sure you hit that like button, subscribe, and share it with some friends.